Yeah, I'm uh, very pleased to moderate this panel. I think this topic is very close to my heart, um, supply chain, and we are not a big group today, so uh, we would really love to make it interactive. Um, don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, there will be, of course, time for questions more at the end, but um, yeah, let's see how it goes. So, uh, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm Darina. Um, in my previous life, I've been working in supply chain for like five, six years uh, in uh, different areas um, international road transportation, multimodal transportation, warehouse management, and uh, now um, I'm working for an IoT company builder, Next Big Thing, um, in Berlin. And that's how basically I got into actually IoT and blockchain company builder. So that's how I got into the blockchain area and um, been looking into uh, different use cases um, in supply chain. And uh, I'm very pleased to um, moderate the panel today and I would like to introduce our panelists. Um, we'll start with uh, Mikhail. So uh, Mikhail is um, coming uh, from a very interesting background. He was a lawyer for many years and uh, three years ago he switched for, as he says, another side. Now he's working for Allianz ESA as um, uh, basically maritime um, insurance specialist. Yeah, um, I'm sorry. Um, so, <laughs> um, and uh, I think uh, Michael brings a very um, interesting expertise to the table um, from the um, legislation perspective as well as, well as um, uh, very practical questions of how uh, insurance work um, in the real environment. Um, then we have Elke. Uh, from IBM. Elke is an uh, IoT architect and um, he has, she has been working on the blockchain topic uh, since uh, three, four years, educating um, mainly uh, customers of IBM on the topic of blockchain, covering um, with the 20 years of experience, uh, covering different technical topics. Uh, before and uh, then slowly transit, uh, well, not slowly transition to uh, to the blockchain. Um, so uh, we have a really great technical expert on the panel, and we also have um, Niels, um, uh, who uh, is uh, very much uh, well deep into the topic of uh, use cases uh, for blockchain in supply chain and he has uh, he is an author of several studies for um, yeah basically use cases uh, for blockchain on supply chain published uh, in 2016-17 um, so uh, we would like actually Michael made a great uh, proposal to open the panel with this uh, video. Uh, it's very very short, but uh, let's just have a look at it. Forty seconds. <laughs> What's happening here? These are very recent news from uh, 7th uh, of March, so just uh, three days ago. There was a huge fire on uh, one of the container ships uh, from Maersk um, in the Indian Ocean. And um, yeah, then we talk, I think it's, it, it's a very interesting um, story to uh, say there are so many different risks, there are so many different inefficiencies within supply chains and uh, we are going to um, uh, basically discover today uh, how to tackle some of the problems, uh, what, what are the most urgent ones, what could we solve um, and etc. Um, so I would like to um, ask Niels maybe first uh, give a short intro about the use cases he has been working on 
uh, he has discovered during his um, research to open up our panel. So that's better. Right. Um, so yeah, I'm a PhD student at TU Hamburg. Basically, what we do is we look into supply chain use cases, logistics use cases, and we ask experts and literature about what is basically the reason things you can do with supply chain. And for our first paper, we basically propose four use cases we, we derive from literature, so from practice and, and science. Um, and one one major use case or one thing you talk about is document exchange. So when you when you think of a global supply chain, there's tons of documents attached to this. And sea freight, um, one of the for container costs, like 15% of the cost is just managing paper-based documents. Um, the second use case we talk about is tracing. So back tracing history of anything you can think of. And um, typical example is um, food. So when you think of a food contamination, what happens today, typically, you can't really tell that this was contaminated. So you don't know that the contam a food contamination that the producer has this happened during production, or is that something that has happened um, during, during transport, or is that just happened in the supermarket? So what you typically do is just, you just get, get rid of all of this. If you're from uh, northern Germany, you might remember the E. coli crisis, so that was an E. heck uh, problem. Still today, we don't really know what the reason was. We don't know what the cause of this was, we don't know when this contamination happens, happened. And during the crisis, nobody could tell like where did this uh, food actually travel, but it was about it's still not, there's not fully traceable. So one thing you could think of there is to basically just cover every step of food and then also be able to backtrace. And you can see these things like Walmart implements this with IBM um, on, I think on pigs, like half, like food and, and pigs you can eat. Um, what we also looked into is provenance, so that the typical, the typical use case is medicine. Um, so when you buy medicine and, and less controlled countries, or even in Germany, there's fake medicine, so this is, this is produced by, by people with forged med medicine, and you can, what you, what you could imagine is that you can somehow scan a QR code or any, any item on this package of the medicine and backtrace it and tell if it was made by the original manufacturer. And then we, we have a force use case, and this is kind of what we say is dropping IoT data, so what, what we think of is, at some point in time, you will have all these IoT devices, and what do you do with data? Like, how do you get rid of it? And it's not, maybe not the best idea to have an open gateway for these. It's, it's complicated to write, so, so an idea is to, to just push this to a decentralized database and make it accessible to everyone. Um, yeah, so I can talk some time already. <laughs> Wonderful. So, uh, Michael, um, in your point of view, what are the most urgent use cases to address within supply chain with blockchain? Well, supply chain <coughs> is more a pattern than a use case because there's a large variety of uh, use cases within the supply chain. He mentioned some. Uh, track and trace in, in, in transfer to answer the question, where's my stuff now? I want to know where it is. The other one is provenance. He was talking about food provenance we're implementing. So from farm to fork, uh, monitor the way which hands have been, has this food uh, gone through and if something went wrong, who could be impacted to do product recalls in, 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 uh, when, when something happens. Or for our financial supply chain, uh, plan for payments, or think of trade finance as the financial part of an export of a container, where part payments are uh, due by progress of transport to make this planable, uh, or look for this, uh, the, the happy side of a process if it ends and you get dispute for dispute resolution to have transparency 
through the process to, to monitor where are the weaknesses, what, what went wrong and how you can uh, make the process more efficient. These are a lot of varieties uh, of the supply chain pattern, I would call it, and it's heavily worked on in all the industries. It's not uh, related only to, to, to transport. Supply chain is um, everywhere. Yeah, thank you. I would, I would assist this. Um, where basically, the supply chain is everywhere. I, I see it from, from the, with the glasses of uh, the cargo insurance lawyer. Um, and, and we see that the transparency um, within the supply chain has got a, a whole new angle through the use of some blockchain use cases. Um, because until today, or until a couple of month or years ago, um, the supply chain was not really visible and most of the players kind of set on the data and set on different parts of the supply chain and were not very eager to share it. And what we see now is the kind of shift in the attitude of the players that they are ready to share the data, make the supply chain more transparent and, trans and share it with, with other persons or other companies which may be interested. Um, and that's where, where we as carbon insurers um, are um, not only interested but, but only are really affected directly as we see that blockchain is arriving within the, within our, uh, the, the, uh, with our customers and they are trying to make blockchain use cases where we think we can um, assist them. Um, well, one use case actually is the, the MERSC um, IBM project, which I guess we will be talking about later, yeah. um, which, is, which is quite interesting, um, where you have all the documents ready in the supply chain, um, and you can basically, I guess, track a container from gate out to gate in, ship a zone container. Um, other interesting use cases is the use of um, letters of credit, which is which are used to finance the trade. Um, and you can put this for land and transport basically. Absolutely. That's actually Elke also men mentioned at the beginning uh, that this truck and trace um, case is rather urgent as well as uh, from Michael's point of view. And I think uh, it makes sense now to cover the topic of IBM and Mars partnership a little bit more in details and Elke can give us um, some very interesting insights. Well, the collaboration between IBM and Maersk to establish an open platform for uh, the tracing of containers uh, started in March last year. Um, they have been working on selected uh, tracks, for example, and with selected um, partners of the ecosystem, for example, Schneider Electric in France, to transport a container by truck to Rotterdam, from Rotterdam then to New York in the US, which means in Rotterdam the port and the customs authorities are involved and on the US side, uh, Homeland Security and Customs too. They had a, a trip with uh, flowers from Kenya to Rotterdam, um, they had uh, pineapples um, from Colombia and oranges from California. So selected products, selected uh, tracks and uh, now in January they took the next step and they announced that this a project will be um, released into a joint venture, so we will formalize it, find an enterprise, a joint enterprise. With Maersk owning 51% of that enterprise, IBM 49%, will be headquartered in the US, in the New York uh, area, and it will drive forward uh, <coughs> the application uh, development, uh, will establish customer boards, and um, will drive forward uh, the solution which is um, by now two modules, you already mentioned it, that one is the shipping information pipeline to track and trace the way of the container and know what is in it, what, uh, where is it now, what's the next step in the, in the chain. And the second one is the paperless trade, where all the papers related uh, to the transport of this container are stored and securely handed over to the next party, signed, authorized, etc., um, on the blockchain instead of um, the 
real paper. So the paper, there's a twin electric train and the blockchain, which speeds up um, uh, the process and the efficiencies and makes it more secure. You can't, you can't copy paper and it's much more difficult to, for fraudulent uh, actions to do it uh, on a blockchain. Uh, how does, uh, does Mars or IBM approach um, involvement of partners? Because there were already some partners announced and uh, I think for the, to predict the development of this particular project it's important to understand how we involve the infrastructure. Absolutely, so it will be an open industry platform, so it will not be used by Maersk only, it's open for the complete industry, whoever is involved the freight forwarders, the terminal operators, the custom authorities, whoever wants to join uh, this uh, solution is invited to do so. And um, yes, it will be um, developed by this joint venture, there will be a customer board uh, discussing the, the future and new functionalities of this um, endeavor and of course they are all looking for standardizing the processes, for simplifying them when setting it on a new platform and looking for um, yeah, gaining efficiencies in that very uh, cluttered uh, um, and decentralized process in a highly competitive environment. So we're all looking forward who will join because there's you need a kind of trust in the industry to trust this open solution, but it will be a separate company, it will not Immersed, it will not be IBM, it will be this joint venture, a separate company to drive this forward. Mm -hmm. um, I think this, that's the general approach in supply chain that as one player you cannot make a change. That's why you have to partner up, you have, involve, uh, you have to involve other stakeholders. Therefore, I'm wondering, um, like we talked with Elke before about forming this consortium, for, forming this uh, joint venture. What are the um, hidden um, or not hidden obstacles? How long did it take? There are a lot of questions always uh, associated with forming a joint venture. In this case, uh, like IP rights and um, rights, um, different rules for the members to enter or exit and etc. Yeah. Well, for this case, I very much it's. Um, a little bit uh, an easier one because it was the endeavor from the beginning that it will be this uh, two parties uh, for the IP and de co-development of, of the solution. But a general pattern when forming a um, collaboration consortium to do a process on a blockchain um, is to make thoughts on who owns what, who owns the data, who's responsible for the data, who owns which parts of the code, what do we do if new members join the consortium, what uh, is expected from them, uh, money to uh, cover the, their part on intellectual property, do they have to bring in, uh, in a new intellectual property to uh, bring the solution forward, what happens if a participant wants to leave. So the data is still there, blockchain, you cannot delete records on the blockchain, so uh, what do the others have to pay if somebody leaves and leaves his uh, intellectual property IP into that solution? Uh, there are a lot of legal questions. Uh, if you don't have a contract in your collaboration, then some uh, legal constructs uh, are in Germany where uh, legal people are afraid of and ask what's your appetite of risk, so you need a contract to uh, deal with the, the, the duties of the of the parties. And so <laughs> okay, yes. <laughs> so there's a lot of uh, beyond technology in the business process. There's a lot of organization uh, and governance uh, to to talk about when separate uh, uh, enterprise entities go into a common uh, solution to drive their business process forward. Yeah, I think this is a very interesting case and this is not only the questions of general um, joint ven venturing but also like blockchain technology, if we have registered certain data there, um, it stays forever, so that's the legacy and um, the parties will have to deal with that. Um, I, I think what is really interesting for, especially for, for the blockchain community is 
that there, there are other uh, more projects mm -hmm. within the log 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 logistics industry. For example, there is a consortium out um, with Japanese banks, owners, um, and uh, uh, carriers who conducted trade from Japan to China. There is a consortium in Korea, which makes well, as well to try to, to figure out similar um, platforms. And um, the harbors and the customs authorities are kind of open up to this technology. That is my impression, especially when I let's see for Rotterdam. And um, I think what we will see in the next well, in the future, I don't know if it's the near future or the next future, is that there will a couple of different platforms arise from different carriers. Um, and then I will have your platform too, I guess. Um, and they, they need to, to talk to each other because all of them will need to have access to the port systems or to the custom systems. Um, so um, I, I guess this could be a driver for this interoperability of blockchain, which I learned yesterday is necessary. Um, and um, I think that is worth a, worth a thought, at least, especially in this panel. Um, yeah, uh, I would say there is lots of movement. It's not only in Europe, but we see with uh, Maersk and IBM, um, there are um, very impressive projects in Asia. Um, so that's not to forget that uh, there is another part of the world uh, also looking on how to improve their processes. And um, I think uh, Elke has uh, very great experience um, now. She's um, doing a lot of edu educational, well, not educational projects, but kind of explaining blockchain and explaining uh, the benefits um, as well uh, for general IBM customers, but as well uh, for players within different supply chains. And uh, maybe you can share with us uh, what is the general understanding of small and medium enterprises, as well as rather bigger corporates, uh, what's their perception and what is their uh, learning curve, because um, that will take a while or might take a while. And of course, we are, I'm talking for myself as technologists, we always need to understand how fast it takes industry to pick up on the newest developments. As we're talking to customer or colleagues uh, who are afraid about blockchain, there's the usual first understanding that blockchain is something with Bitcoin or, or payments. So the first lesson is to explain that the blockchain technology has a much broader approach. It's a general purpose blockchain for transaction processing and you can do much more about it uh, with uh, only payments or even the finance sector. So uh, blockchain is a technology for maintenance logs, for food provenance, for there are a lot of, um, everywhere where you need a trusted uh, execution of transactions uh, among parties, blockchain uh, is a sweet spot. And when they understand that uh, um, there are varieties of blockchain, there are public blockchain, there are blockchains with identities, why is uh, identity important for blockchain in business, etc. Then they start with um, use cases. So I'm, I'm always storytelling our uh, reference project and explaining what others are doing um, in their business to bring multiple parties together and do transaction processing in a collaborative way, in a more efficient way. And then I see that uh, the analogy uh, exercise works. So they see the pattern, they understand it, and they transform it to their <coughs> industry. So usually they go home after the first workshop or somehow stuffed <laughs> and said, okay, I have to, to, to think about it. I now understand it's a, a really compelling technology. We could do a lot with it. And then it takes usually some time until they come back and say, I have some ideas for my enterprise and can you help me explore the use cases I uh, wrote down and to see if it understood it right that it's a good blockchain use case. Because a lot of people then take every pattern in a multi-party system for a blockchain use case. And a lot of multi-party system can better be solved with a database and a portal in an existing uh, technology that don't need a complexity of, a, of blockchain to do that. And then we uh, discuss with the clients uh, the blockchain aspect of the use case and um, yes, and 
see if they say, yes, let's do a minimal viable product and have a pilot and look with the fingers at that use case and the technology. Nice. How long does it take from the first introduction until they actually decide to do something more tangible? Months. Okay. It's not a fast uh, turning business. Uh, it needs an understanding, it's that collaboration approach. A lot of uh, enterprises are a little bit afraid of doing that um, common business process in a, we say, co-opetition model, where you in the industry are sometimes competitors and sometimes have to cooperate uh, on the same purpose of a client. Um, it's about trust, <laughs> not only the technology, also in the collaboration of uh, enterprises. Very interesting. Uh, Niels, do you have anything to add from uh, your experience? Or Niels ex interviewed uh, lots of industry representatives, especially in supply chain. And uh, I think there were quite interesting findings on how the technology will be adopted and uh, what kind of value it can bring. Well, but it's not findings yet, so we're still in the process, right? So this takes, takes time. But um, what, I, what I think is interesting, or what you have to understand is this is not, we're not there yet. Like it's not something you can go and get it out of the box and you can't be a transportation company here in Hamburg Harbor and say, okay, I'm going to do blockchain tomorrow. I'll download the blockchain uh, software package, click install, and that's it. That's it. Many of these processes are super manual. There's no, there's no connection to ERP systems that, are, that works out of the box. There's no, like many of these things are not solved. And these companies that do try these, and, and then, I mean, of course, there's Hyperledger and there's Corda, and, but also, like, if you try Ethereum, like, this is not, this is not enterprise-ready software, right? So you have to keep that in mind. And there's still, still way to go. And there's so many unsolved things. Like, we've talked about scalability today. You, you and Airbus, you basically, you point out everything that every practitioner has this problem. Privacy, like, a proper enterprise, they're not interested in somebody finding out what, how your processes work. And, and then, but in the end, you have two schools, right? You have this school of saying, okay, we'll become a, a network and you'll make money off the edges, so end to end. Or you, you say, okay, we make money off data analysis. And this is the open school. And then you have a school where you say, okay, we basically want to keep our secrets. And then, then this, how do you use blockchain in this environment? So because this is a, what I find interesting is this comes from such a community that's very based in open source and very open space. And then we try to connect it with a very enterprise and probably secretive environment. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, that, that's a challenge and I think Michael now representing industry, insurance industry can also share his uh, opinion on what might be possible and what is still under consideration or under, yeah, what are, where the, do the doubts come from? <laughs> in, um, in terms of supply chain? Or? Yeah, in terms of supply chain and... Um, <laughs> well, um, the, the first doubt is exactly what you mentioned, it's, um, that we have two different kinds of blockchain, the private one and the public one, and um, we don't, when we're talking about insurance on the blockchain, or especially supply chain on the blockchain, we need to have some mechanism of um, declining access to the data, because um, we're talking about confidential data here, we're talking about clients' data, which cannot be made public if to, totally. So what we need is a, in terms of insurance-wise, what we need would be a kind of private blockchain, however you will draft it. Um, now, secondly, um, I've, I've read, when, when I started to, to get into this, this matter, I, I read quite a lot about um, well, the supply chain, and then you put some sensors in a, in a container, temperature sensors, and if the temperature deviates for about five degrees or so, then well, you can throw away the goods in the container and the children will pay. 
Um, and, and coming from the insurance side, I would say, well, it's, in most of the times, it isn't that easy because um, it, it can't be automated that easily, at least. Um, we have policies with 10 to 20 pages, um, which, which need to be transformed into a smart contract. So we just talked outside of it. I mean, a smart contract is basically nothing more than, in my humble opinion, I'm not a technician, I'm a, I'm a learned layman, or, <laughs> or interested layman, but a smart contract is nothing more than, than an, an if, then, uh, if something happens, then something is executed. And we have, well, literally, well, dozens of such conditions, at least, in, in our insurance policy, so um, um, in, in case there is a temperature deviation, for example, the payment um, of the insurance won't be processed automatically unless we, we really go deep into the matter um, and reform the policies, the payment procedure, and uh, the way we deal with our clients. So that would be a long term <coughs> thing. Um, on, on short term, um, well, I think. I, I see in the insurance industry a couple of um, movements as regards blockchain and the connection of blockchain to smart contracts. We as Allianz have participated in an initiative which is called B3I for reinsurance purposes and we took it together with, our, with the help of IBM. <laughs> um, and that's a fascinating initiative which goes live this year, has gone live, right? Um, but um, that's only for reinsurance purposes, not, not for the direct insurance we're talking about here. And um, probably you heard about those cases of flight insurance, um, where uh, you, some, an insurance company will pay in case the flight is delayed, you can insure yourself against delay or um, that, that cancellation of flights. I mean, that, that, that's easy. You can look at one oracle. Um, a, a data page where it says, well, flight is delayed or not, and then payment is processed. And basically, it's, I, I think it's not necessary to use the blockchain technology for it, but it's, it's a data base after all. Well, but it sounds cool. Um, <laughs> now, um, but, but turn, turning back to the supply chain, I think especially those platforms which tend to grow right now in the logistics sector, um, are, are quite interesting, and we as insurers need to, to get into those, well, get a grip on what's happening there because our customers will go there. We need to understand what our customers will do. And um, there will be, and I think that's one of the approaches of this, this IBM MERS project and the other projects, there will be a certain data standard as regards the document, as regards the documentation and the data. Um, and you, you will need to understand the data standard in order to conduct further business. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, there are lots of points to touch upon. First one, I think, <laughs> in general, um, we, we shared with Michael before, and basically his opinion is that uh, insurance will look like a simple button to press uh, within ERP software or any other software which supply chain uh, partners use. This is all one, like the insurance, Maybe you can talk about value-added <laughs> approach of insurance. Yeah, um, um, well, we disregard this, this button stuff, but um, well, well, actually, yes, um, insurance, cargo insurance is a kind of value-added service. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if I look at the um, at, at what we are doing, you, you saw the ship over there, yeah. I mean, the ship which is burned. I mean, it was an ultra-large ultra large container vessel. Um, which was still burning today, um, had the capacity of about 15,000 containers, and um, about 8,000 containers were on board. Now, when we're looking at one container, uh, normally we have a worth of around between 15,000 and 1.5 million euros on board one container. Um, just just to, to give you a size of what we're talking about, the last really big accident of a container vessel was the Emerald Comfort, in 2013, which broke into two parts in the Indian Ocean, and said, it's done. Um, and then we, we talk about at least 300 million euros in damages in total, which was there simply in cargo value. Um, so that's the value of the cargo. And somebody contracted for this cargo. We have a buyer and we have a seller. Somebody sold. <coughs> so that's a lot of money involved here. Now, and then we have the logistics 
sector which help the buyer and the seller to fulfill their contracts of sales, basically. So kind of value-added service too. We have the packers who pack the kind of stuff, the container into the, uh, the, the, the goods into the container. And at the end, we have the insurance who bears a part of the risk that a ship breaks into two parts and sinks into the Indian Ocean, uh, which, which doesn't happen so often, fortunately, for us. Um, but yeah, that's what I mean with value-added service. We, we, we give another additional service and help the buyer which is our customer as well as the seller, um, to fulfill their contracts of sales or to mitigate their risk. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, this particular case of the ship is a pretty easy one because it's yes or no. So the <laughs> it's yes or no, basically. All, all containers are on fire. That's, you, you lost the cargo. But uh, unfortunately, also from my practice, that. In the real um, life, it's always very difficult to understand what caused the problem or if it's really lost. Like maybe these are certain chemical products being transported and uh, after the temperature fluctuation, you don't actually know if we were affected or not. You need to take it to the lab and understand if the chemical um, chemicals were changed. So um, even the example of temperature fluctuation is not so yes or no, and uh, it will be very difficult to um, embed it in the smart contracts, because now how it works, we always have a surveyor who comes and looks at the cargo when it was yeah, um, offloaded, um, and surveyor needs to understand what actually happened and who was um, who, who is responsible for it. and. Um, it would be included in the smart contract, just not for the insurance, but for this container was affected, so it cannot be unloaded like a regular container. It has to be um, going to a quarantine area or whatever. It still would be a part of the smart contract, just not automatically paid. Absolutely. Uh, I think this is the question more of having this verified parties within smart contracts and um, interacting with them. Actually, uh, Actually, I, I guess we, we need to you know, not look very, very much in detail about what kind of smart contract we're talking about. Do we talk about the, the contract of the fragment yeah, for transportation between the owner and the carrier of the vessel, or Maersk, for example, um, which, which could be a smart contract, self-executable, in case that the ship goes to the harbor and the uh, consignment is unharmed in the way, um, so we could use a small smart contract could be used to execute the payment and to help the contract of the fragment being fulfilled. Um, or do we use as a contract of sales, which is a kind of sale above, um, or the trade finance contract, which could be aided by smart contract, yes, but principally you're right, you can see the container is damaged and then somebody could process it further. And the problem with smart contract is that it's not one contract? many pieces of the contract. In that part, you talk about the, the smart contract of that certain block of transportation. And this has nothing to do with insurance claims. Just this, was it transported in a correct way, with the correct temperature or not? If yes, do this. If no, do nothing else. After the no and the proof, if it's damaged or not, the smart contract of the claim insurance um, would then um, grip. So actually, each each part of the um, of the of transport ways um, have different blocks, and each block have an executed part or an own smart contract. And that's very difficult to explain in an overall setting. I agree. But still, that part would be our own smart contract, and I think you're right. That it's too early for a smart contract for insurance claim while transporting it, but actually nothing, insurance claim has nothing to do in that area of the, of the entire supply chain. Oh, actually, 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 it, actually it does. If something happens to the goods and we have to pay for it, and that's part of the insurance claim. Yes, um, but, but, but the execution, the automated execution. Yeah, um, the, the probably, I, I, when, when, when I talk to, to you blockchain guys, sorry, <laughs> um, I, I always come to the point where, where, where I think some, sometimes um, 
we're talking kind of different languages because when, when I talk about a contract, I mean the legal contract between two persons. I mean, you go to the bakery and you buy a bread. It's a contract of sales, a purchase contract. Um, um, and um, when, when you talk about smart, or when, when you talk about smart contracts, um, the, what, what is meant is it's a kind of self-executable program which does something which is not a contract in the legal sense. So sometimes there's misunderstanding, doesn't it? But uh, I don't think I understand correctly uh, what you meant. It. Like, okay, so we have a contract between the owner and the, let's say, the placeholder or even insurers that within this contract you can just take the rules from there, the clause from there, and make it into like many smart contracts. <coughs> There's misunderstandings of having legal contracts and the technical construct of a smart contract, which is nothing else than a program which is executed, uh, leads to the suggestion that we change the term smart contract, which uh, is a term in blockchain, for example, chain code or something else, because this um, term leads to misunderstanding all over, all over the industry. And yes, with the smart or with chain code, um, it has the value proposition of automatic um, execution, but you have to plan for reality. So if you plan for the container to reach the harbor and this, uh, the, your chain code says it will reach the harbor, you did not plan for shit happens, uh, it's, it's burning, it's sinking, yeah. then, then you're stuck. In some implementations, this smart contract will never end and will be there for, uh, for eternity and uh, you have to think about how to stop it technically. So plan for the reality, it's hard. Maybe, maybe you would know it, so what I think is a major difference is when you have a contract in real life, there's still things that you know, can be kind of negotiated about it, so you imply things, while in a program, like, this is definite, so yes or no, there's no maybe, or maybe I don't understand this differently, or maybe it's someone else's fault. Just a quick note, uh, sorry I can't be on the panel today due to company policy, but in private capacity, my opinion is here, like the biggest problem is definitely still data reliability and event detection, so what happened really inside a truck, uh, in the container. And there we have a long phase where we have to try like, to get to the autonomous contracting. And for example, there will be the Schiedsgericht, so whenever a data is doubted, so someone has to send the data set somewhere else. And this can be another smart contract, which has a like, claim solving, uh, kind of task, or this can be a human, which is more likely in the next phase. And we also need to integrate like these confirmation steps, or like a driver, he of course he want, doesn't want to have a bad rating, or like some less payment or whatever, so he will see if the data is not right, I will send it somewhere to be solved. And there is no telematic company out there at the moment, I think, who can give 100% guarantee on the data, and this will stay. Uh, during the next years still, uh, we have to get there but step by step and I think like now it might be automated contracting and then it's intelligent uh, uh, contracting and at some point it will be autonomous, there will be small logistics but yeah, until there, there, will be, there are a lot of problems but we still need to tackle it and I would go with the, the low hanging fruits like ice cream, right, it's just yes or no, five degrees plus and it's not high value, so I guess uh, Allianz ESA would say oh, I can right away automatically pay the money because I know if I send a person there he will see what I know. It's just all method. And I think even temperature data right now, it's like the, it has authority, so it's, it's, uh, it's sent from A to B and it's the basis for the payment. So why not going with these data instead of talking and just making the big problems, like or tackling first mm -hmm. before we even started. Thank you, Kathleen. Yeah, I think the temperature data is, uh, of course, a uh, big topic in the industry, and um, the interesting thing, whenever a case happens, uh, insurance companies anyways request it. Maybe we can 
can prove me right or wrong, but this is what uh, most of freight forwarders uh, say. And this is interesting. However, it still doesn't prove that, um, that damage happened due to temperature fluctuation. So cases like ice cream are quite easy, but uh, they are not, um, they don't make up the entire volume of uh, marine insurance, for instance, in Allianz and there are a lot of other goods. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, obviously. I mean, ice cream is one product, chairs are another product, computers, and yeah. have everything with which. Everything. Mm -hmm. what, what travels from A to B can be insured. Um, and, and if you want to take up insurance, yeah, I can buy so. Um, but but if, I, if I may jump a, a bit back to what you said, and you, I guess what you meant is that you can put those automated contracts, or how did you call them? The chain code, the chain code, um, to to the different parts of the whole supply chain. But I think what you need is to have a kind of joint under a common understanding of all the players who participate in this supply chain or in this platform, and um, that they will rely on some some well that there will be a common understanding, which I would call a contract or general conditions of the platform which will then be used to process the payment or, or if you have um, uh, an arbitration clause and like you said, I mean, the, 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 the disputes will be kind of put away and, and adjudicated by someone else. So basically you, you can use a, a chain, code. A chain code, <laughs> you, can, you can use chain code um, on, on, on parts of the supply chain but you need an underlying legal foundation for it. My opinion, no? probably a bit tainted because I'm a lawyer, but I, I think. <laughs> <I did. laughs> and uh, I guess legal foundation uh, comes together with uh, a question of uh, standardization of certain technologies because now we see a lot of things uh, happening and a lot of uh, things being rather different. So uh, the standard uh, should also arrive. I just find the topic very interesting. So I would add some more. Uh, I think we're actually talking about the exact same. I think we're talking about the exact same thing, no matter, no matter if it's a smart contract or a chain code. Um, what I was saying is you, you have a contract, 20 pages um, for your insurance and stuff, that's a legal contract. Yeah. And you know the conditions under why, under what you have to investigate more or not, um, and the claim will be made, and so on. And in that ship, obviously, we have been on a certain part of the supply chain, and now something is um, happening. And now um, I could either say I make the chain code or the smart contract, whatever it is, uh, very easy, and say. Um, should that container be unloaded in a regular way, yes or no? That would be a very easy chain code, and it would say no because the temperature difference was 100 degrees, <laughs> which is quite a lot. So obviously something happened um, there. If no, then for sure there will be no insurance claim, or this part of the supply chain at least. Um, if yes, um, you have to make a decision, um, must be there more investigation, or should be there an automated um, on claim, the low-hanging fruit. Um, still, this is just a decision, and um, now this is the question, who can make the decision? Is there defined rules in the contract, like temperature more than, than a good is ice cream, and the temperature is more than 10 percent than A? That could be automatic. Yep. If not, then I have to make the decision, must be there a human, and I want to add some complexity, or can it be an artificial intelligence making the decision <laughs> based on data you have in your insurance? Because being from Allianz, you know that many decisions could be made by an artificial intelligence because you have so much data about what you are paying or not paying or investigating in the past um, that an AI could make a more than 99% forecast what you would make as a decision um, and come to the same con conclusion. Um, so many things can be automated. It's just not easy and you start with the easy stuff, but it, it can be done. Just don't think as one legal contract being in one chain code or smart contract. That would not, never be the case. So can I ask something about this? Do you think this is, does it make sense or 
AI to make uh, some legal decision, right? So if we are talking about the legal context, on the clause, uh, there have to be like, you know, we have to use the, the legal I mean, uh, the protocols and standards for that. But, you know, AI decision can be very, like, um, can be very uh, biased and they can't they can make um, the legal decision as a lawyer. So we are, I think it's, it's just not possible to use AI to make, um, you know, because we, we understand that we cannot translate on the course uh, in the legal context into smart, into very smart context, because a lot of cross there are quite advanced and it needs some kind of professional judgment as well. So it's, I don't think it makes sense or it's possible on, on AI to do so. What, yeah, what do you think, um, yeah, the panelists? Actually, I, I, say, I think my opinion is on this for, for legal AI is unfortunately pretty good to do because everything is well documented, right? Yeah. So every lawyer has, everything is written down and when AI, what you do is learn from documents. So unfortunately, kind of, or, well, you can use other sources. <laughs> but, um, you I can, you do, have, you have things to study on. So for insurance, I, I mean, you will hate me for this, but probably you can, you can make many decisions beforehand, or could have a biased uh, suggestion. Well, with uh, artificial intelligence, uh, the difference between a product, if then else, and artificial intelligence is that AI is able to formulate thesis, and somebody, a trainer, has to approve or reject that thesis so that the learning within the artif artificial intelligence takes place. And I think for some uh, use cases there will be the chance that uh, this can be trained. Other things are automated, like uh, Allianz started with the first smart contract in the weather, the hurricane. Yeah. Insurance was the first automated smart contract. If a hurricane appears according to the predefined weather data in that uh, geography, then the insurance policyholder gets an amount of money. So this is completely <coughs> automatable. You don't need artificial intelligence for that. It's a simply yes or no decision. And I think this uh, kind of decision making in, in insurance and other things will, will evolve over time. Starting with the low hanging fruit, the very easy parts, and going to the uh, legal tech, artificial intelligence whatsoever. So there's decades for us to research and work on. So going forward with that. Okay, wonderful. Then about future, my last question would be uh, within the next two, three years, what kind of proof of concepts, uh, projects you think will be happening uh, in this blockchain supply chain area? Predictions. <laughs> Predictions. So what, what, what we see is that um, there's industry standards trying to, to, um, to collaborate on, on, on a standard platforms like the IBM Merck solution or deriving from the Walmart project or projects uh, from with the pork in China, from Farm to Fork and the mangoes, now going to Food Trust solution which is now being piloted in the Walmart area, in the ecosystem, but will be in the second half of the year, open food provenance, food trust platform. So I think um, there will be some platforms opening for a complete industry, but we will also see um, blockchain platforms for a specific consortium, a closed shop, just um, making their um, business processes uh, more efficient. Uh, and better. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, first, I, I think we, we won't see an artificial intelligence processing cargo claims within the next three years. Um, I'm quite certain about that. <laughs> um, uh, that was the time frame you asked before. Yeah. Um, sec secondly, um, I think we will see the development of blockchain-based decentralized, decentralized databases for different carriers, from different carriers, um, and from different freight forwarders, and the, the main um, the, the, the 
what, what then will be necessary to, to see if they can talk to each other and if they can talk to customs authority and if they can talk to a port authority and the like. If, if they can, if, if that will be the case within the next couple of years, then I think blockchain technology will have the, will be a real game changer in the logistics industry. And if not, then well, it's probably not. I mean, we are 2018 now. Since when is the technology out there? 16 is or well, longer, no? But but since it's six. Yeah, but that's yeah, since 15, 16, 17, we saw a real hype. But, but I think now is the time to, to get some, some traction on the street. And we need to see if it works. I think now blockchain arrives finally to very complex industries like supply chain. There is lots to optimize. There are a lot of problems, but only now we can talk how actually we build certain processes or rebuild certain processes. Before, all the applications were rather on, yeah, exclude an intermediary. So that's pretty exciting time, yes? So yes, I, I'm a researcher, so I, I can only make wishes or what I hope for. Um, one thing I hope is going to be solved is this government's problem, because that's a huge one. Um, nobody has an idea what's, what happens if I, put, if I make a mistake, what happens if I if I do something wrong, what, how do I decide for, for, for common standards or what I expect of data to be onboarded? There's no solution to this up to now. So the second thing, this is, it's also related to governance. What we kind of see now is that people say, okay, so the blockchain technology is working really fast. So what I do is I build a platform on top uh, to be blockchain agnostic. And I'm not sure if that was the idea of blockchain originally to have basically a kind of platform economy idea is a centralized thing. I thought this was all talking about we have a decentralized system and what we kind of see is, well, let's move back because the centralized things run too bad. Um, so this is, this is kind of a discussion I, I hope to be solved because this is a huge problem. Um, and then what I also hope is that we get, get to see some more stable, more maintainable software. That's also for our <laughs> uh, developer friends, because uh, for for uh, even for large corporations, this is not a this is not a stage where they say this is enterprise ready or this is what I want to use in daily daily life. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. I think that's the time to close the panel. Uh, we still have a couple of minutes for personal questions uh, to panelists, but uh, thank you very much, Michael, Elke, and Nils, for being together with us today and giving your very valuable insights. Let's